Crash Course in Christian Art. So Christian art is a big term for a lot of different art done over a lot of movements and over thousands of years. This video is to help you kind of get a nice scaffolding so that when you learn more, you kind of know where to slot it in in your mind. So we're gonna start with very, very early Christian art. A lot of early Christian art did not have icons or images of figures, but instead symbols to evoke parts of the gospel and the story of Jesus and the story of Christ stories of Christianity, partly because there was some level of persecution, partly because they were living in a Roman world that had a lot of visual imagery. So they were kind of catching things that already existed and recoding it. One of the most classic recodes is the grapevine. So in Roman art, you see it as being about celebration and Dionysus and um, in Christianity, you also have the grapevine and it goes to a parable by Jesus where he is the vine and the believers are the branches. And it really worked well for early Christians because it could be both just Roman visuals and also Christian imagery. And here we see another image of a grapevine and here it's paired with peacocks. And peacocks is another early Christian symbol. It's a symbol of immortality. And so somebody who is Roman would see this as just something you see all the time. And somebody who's Christian would understand the deeper meaning. Now, one of those symbols that has remained and you still see it pretty commonly is the fish. So particularly in the early era where Christians needed to signal it to each other that they were part of the same faith and were somewhat persecuted by the Romans, they had fish. And so you would see a fish say as a symbol that this is a place where Christians can worship together. So why the fish? So partly this has to do with the miracle of the loaves and fishes where Jesus miraculously feeds the masses and shows that he can transform their lives. But it's also a little bit of wordplay. So ichthyus, which is, it's also an acrostic. So ichthyus is Jesus, anointed of God, son and savior. And that together, if you read down, would say fish. So when do Christians move from these aniconic images to images that do show Jesus? So some people say that this might be the first image of Jesus. It is graffiti from the first century of a figure being crucified, but it's a figure with an animal head. And so if it is an image of Jesus, it's not a religious icon, but sort of a slam. And then about a hundred years later, you really start seeing images that are made for worshipers. And this one, which is narrative, it's Je Jesus with the paralytic, is from Dura Europas from around 235. And by the 300s, you're really seeing a lot more imagery that shows Jesus, often as a singular figure. And very, very often, he is seen in a way related to historic art. So here we have Jesus as a new Apollo. He's the good shepherd, but Apollo was often shown with a sheep or a lamb over him. So somebody who saw this as a Christian would understand it's in line with old kinds of visualizations. He would also be depicted sometimes as a well-heeled gentleman. Here you can see he is in robes, the robes that people might actually have worn at that time. He would have had a beard. He's also sometimes depicted in this era as a new Dionysus, sort of not as fit as Apollo in the Apollo-like depictions, but more full-figured. So basically, to kind of catch us up here, we have gone from aniconic images, that means just symbols to mean a thing, no visualization of him. And then in that very early phase, you see images that are of him, but they're not necessarily icons. By the sixth century, they become full-fledged icon. So what's an icon? An icon is a depiction of um, a religious figure that is meant to be a devotional aid. Now, in some um, practices in Christianity, it's also a liturgical tool, some, so something that you would actually pray with in front of. But one of the key things about icons is that they often don't 
have visual narrative. They don't have a whole story around it, particularly in Byzantine art. And instead, you are supposed to fill in the blanks from your knowledge about that faith. And so like this one, Christ Pantocrator, Christ ruler of all, you see a really classic Byzantine icon. He's holding a book, right? Because that is where his teachings come to us and he is also blessing the faithful. He is looking out at you. The other thing that's really interesting about Byzantine art is by this point, Christ is no longer depicted as a regular person. He's instead depicted as the almighty. And one of the big things that happens is that you see that the face becomes very stylized. So it is not that they forgot how to be realistic, it's that they want to tell important parts of the religious doctrine. In this case, Christ is both earthly and heavenly, and that's why he has two different eyes. At this point in Christianity, you have to remember that it's become a very sophisticated religion. There are, there's a, a system of clergy, there are monasteries, there's a number of adherents and many adherents who are very powerful. And so with all that power and hierarchy, there's also this cre flourishing of art and architecture. And so you see things like these amazing mosaics that are done at Ravenna, enormous, amazing. So Christianity becomes a state religion, which is incredibly important for the future of Christian art in that you see one, more money is put into art. And then two, you see more art is therefore made. And this is also the beginning of the flourishing of styles of Christian art. Both over time, it keeps getting transformed, but also over geography. So a single iconography can look slightly different depending on what part of the world it's made. So the next big movement in terms of Christian art is the schism, where you see in the 11th century, the split between the Eastern and the Western Christian church. And so the Western being what we call Catholicism, sometimes the Eastern being the number of different Orthodox faiths. In the Orthodox Church, still, you see a lot of the similarities between that image we just saw of Christ Pantocrator, and a lot of things like Christ is an icon, and when you look at that icon, you have to understand the complexity of faith. In the Western Church, or in what we now call Catholicism, starting after the 11th century, you see a move towards more and more narrative to tell the story of the faith. And so even in that early period after the schism, artists like Chimabui, so you have artists like Chimabui, he's working in the late 1200s, who is keeping some of those Byzantine elements, like the gold that you see in a lot of Byzantine art to highlight the heavenly nature of faith. But then he's adding certain narrative elements. And look below here how these figures all look like they're kind of realistic. They're kind of having thoughts that we could almost express, see from their expressions. And that sort of narrative instinct is pushed forward in the next era, which is the Renaissance. And the Renaissance has some probably the most famous Christian artworks, things like the Last Supper and, um, and the Sistine Chapel. And a lot of that kind of imagery in this early Renaissance painting by Perugino kind of summarizes what happens. In the Renaissance, you see a flourishing of narrative. This is the marriage of Mary and Joseph. But you also see these sort of outer scenes, other things are happening, like they're really in real space. Plus, you see a lot of realism, and sometimes that realism is highlighted by the use of perspective. By the Renaissance also, we have a vast number of other kinds of stories that are being told. Now, this happens to be the Adoration of the Magi, but it's part of a book of hours. And so people during the Renaissance had all of these other elements of visual culture to help them connect to the faith. And a book of hours was the book that you would use to know which prayers you're supposed to say throughout the day as well as throughout any year. So along with books of hours as personal devotional tools, in churches, you have a lot of liturgical art, like an altarpiece. So this is the altarpiece of Ghent. And 
they often had a combination of imagery. So here we have um, the Lamb of God. Here we have God. And then you have Adam and Eve on the flanking panels, and this would close. In other words, this would be a very complicated and expensive tool that would have been there for you to look at as an adherent while they were celebrating the mass. You could watch this, look at this, as the priest was in the process of um, the wine and bread for you to consume. So along with this Renaissance flourishing of visual imagery and devotional tools, you also had more and more veneration of saints. And they became also something where you'd have a lot of visual culture. Like here we have Saint Sebastian. And because people had saints that were their patron saints, then they would have special devotionals to this. So saints would also have their chapels that were devoted to them and more art would be made for those. Hopefully you're getting the picture that there was a lot of need for Christian art during the Renaissance. And a lot of people um, have said that this flourishing of art and the incredible expense that was often put into Christian art is part of the reason you had the Reformation. For example, some people note that the Sistine Chapel, which was completed in 1512, was in some ways funded by the Pope giving indulgences. So basically you could pay to get out of whatever intellectual or physical crime you had and get time out of purgatory if you paid the Pope. And in 1517, it's when Martin Luther famously put his 95 theses up on the door of a church in Germany. And those 95 theses and Martin Luther himself really was the beginning of the second schism in Christian art. It's the split between the Catholics and the Protestants. So Martin Luther, and here he is depicted, believes that you do not need an intercessor to get to heaven. And so the church does not need these visual images because they have the word, they have the faith. And this results in many parts, particularly in Northern Europe, of the iconoclasm, the destruction of these Christian liturgical artworks, with many Protestant churches being much, much more simple in terms of decoration. But in Catholic regions, you see something else completely different. You see this desire for artists to move to even mo more emotional scenes. So you're really pulling on the heartstrings of the adherents because you want them to know that these are the important things, these visuals, these stories, you need them as part of the faith. And so that's where you see the rise in the South of the Counter-Reformation, but also um, Baroque art, where people like Caravaggio have these moody, dark, um, elements of the painting with bright light being like, this was so amazing. In terms of Christian art, the next kind of big movement is the Enlightenment. So as you move towards the Enlightenment and through the Enlightenment and then the Industrial Revolution, what you find is that oftentimes Christian art is sort of toned down. It's changed its tenor because a lot of other kinds of visual imagery has starting to be created. In the North, of course, you already, at the moment of the Protestant Reformation, artists started looking for other work and they were creating secular work. But even by the um, 18th century, you see that Christian artists all over need to create works of all kinds, including secular art to make a living. And so Christian art just becomes less important to the economy of art. And also Christianity is something where people don't necessarily feel like, even as a Catholic, that they need to have an expensive book of hours. Churches often don't need a new altarpiece. They already have one or they don't have one at all. And so um, you move from that kind of heightened amount of Christian art to fewer and fewer Christian artworks, but then also many, many more 